All right, what I wanted to do today was um, in this class, I want to use Excel to help build some tools that you can use in the future. This course is really all about using computer tools to help you solve problems. And we start out with some pretty simple problems. And today, most of the things that we'll do are pretty simple. Um, you know, some of them might require, you know, you would have wanted to use a calculator or some tool before, but none of this stuff is that hard. But as we build, we'll be doing harder and harder problems um, as we go. And my goal for you in this class is to build your own spreadsheet and have many, many pages, many, many tabs at the bottom where it's set up so that you can solve different types of problems. That way, whether you are in a future course or at work, you could just open up your quick Excel file, throw in the information that you have, the problem you need to solve, and then get the solution quickly. So this Excel file that you build could be very useful. Okay, that's my hope in the course. And I'm going to guide you along with some things here um, as we go through. In each block, in each part of the course, we will be building an Excel sheet. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you three things. I'm going to show you uh, solving systems of equations, linear systems of equations using Excel. And there are multiple ways to do that. And I'm also going to show you newton raphson and Secant method, which are used to solve basically one equation, one unknown. Sounds simple, but it is very useful to have computational tools. Okay, so the first thing I would do is you see a blank Excel sheet. And I'm going to call this one here, uh, I'm going to rename this, and we're going to call this, um, we could call this matrix solution or something like that, solve it. How about that? Something like that. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter exactly. But what we're trying to do here is solve uh, three equations, three unknown is the example, but we could do more than that. We could go four equations, four unknown, five, five unknown, whatever. And you'll see as we go how that works. So uh, in order to do this, let me bring in a sample, uh, an example here. So you can see there is a system of three equations, three unknowns, okay? And that's what we're going to try to solve here. In fact, what I'm going to do, uh, one of the things I'm going to do, just so that helps me see everything and helps you as well, is I'm going to change the row height, uh, make this a little bit bigger, you know, something like that. And I'm going to change the uh, font. Eh, 14 is probably good. Enough. Okay, something like that. Row height and font. That way we hopefully can see this a little better what I'm doing. So uh, we're going to set up something to solve the 3x3 three three problem. So I'm going to write here 3x3, just so that you know this is the 3x3 three three problem, okay? In fact, you'll see why in a moment why I do that. All right, so how do I solve this using Excel? Because Excel is not commonly known to be a matrix algebra tool, but it does have tools in it. Um, and by the way, what I'm showing you is not the only way to solve this. And I will show you using Excel how to solve similar problems in the future. So don't think this is the only time we're going to be doing just this method. I'm going to show you other methods as well. All right, and I'll explain why you might use this method versus other methods in the future. So we're learning one, but we'll learn more. All right, so we got this. First thing I do is because I've got three unknowns in this problem, I've got x1, x2, x3. You could have x, y, z, whatever. I just like to put each unknown as its own column there, okay? Then what I'm going to do on the other side of the equation, um, I'm going to write b. Now that's because I normally set up all the problems to be in this form ax equals b okay that's how i set them up okay is i do it that way so i'm writing it that way so how do i do that so take a look at that top equation it would be minus 5x1 and then there's 0x2 and there's 12x3 right that's how that would look minus 5x1 0x2 plus 12x3 equals what well 60 right and so then i go in the next one i got 4x1 uh, minus x2 that'd be minus 1 minus x3 minus 1 uh, equals minus 2. Good. And then last uh, row there, last equation, x1 uh, minus 2x2 plus 12x3 equals minus 86. All right. 
So you basically set up the equation. That wasn't too bad. And the goal of this is when I show you this, then if you have another three by three matrix, you could quickly open up this Excel tab and plug in your numbers really fast and boom, you'd get the solution really quick. So, but in order to do that, we would have, we have to set this up properly. Now I'm going to call that, this is basically like here is what we would call the A matrix in AX equals B. Okay. Um, and so your A matrix is basically just the coefficients of all the variables on the left hand side and then on the right hand side you can't have any variables anything in x or y or z or x1 x2 x3 you just have to have pure numbers on the right hand side so if you're solving these in general anything that's a just a number by itself bring to the b side on the right hand side all right so we do have a formula in excel that will give us a matrix inverse okay it's one of those things that um you know, when you see it, you're like, oh, yeah, okay, you know, it's not, uh, you know, uh, entirely obvious, but we'll, we'll try to do it. The first thing to do is because a matrix inverse is not just one value, because normally Excel throws just one value, it's actually uh, a three by three matrix inverse is going to have nine values, right? Because there's nine values in the original matrix. When you do the in inverse, when you do the matrix inverse, you will also have nine values. And you say, you might ask yourself, why do I need to do the matrix inverse? Because in order to solve AX equals B, which is basically in order to solve this generalized equation, you're really going to do this. You're really going to write X equals A inverse times B. Okay, that's really what you're going to be doing. Okay, is that. Okay, where the A to the minus 1 is A inverse. I could have also written this, maybe you like this better, to say x equals inverse a times b. We could do it that way too. Um, either way is fine. And um, if you watch other videos with MATLAB, you can, I'll show you, or your calculator, you can do it either one of those ways. Okay. So we need to calculate the inverse, but remember the inverse is not just one number. It's actually nine numbers in a matrix form. So in order to do that, I actually have to highlight it like that. Okay. And then in the formula bar, I do have a formula, M inverse, matrix inverse. Now, here, what I have to do is I have to show what I want to take the inverse of, okay? And I'm almost ready, but the problem is if you hit enter, just like this, May, Excel is still going to only try to give you one number, and the one number is only going to go in the upper left-hand corner cell which in this case is cell B8, right? So you have to do a little trick in Excel. You have to do control shift enter. And when you do control shift enter, then it's like telling MATLAB that, sorry, it's telling Excel, not MATLAB. You're telling Excel that um, you need to have more than just the one number. You need to fill that whole region there um, and give it the matrix inverse. So that's how it's done there. And you could, if you want to, uh, expand this a little bit, get a few numbers here, get a few numbers there, you know, whatever you want to do to make that look better. Okay, so we've got all that right there. So now what we need to do is we need to do matrix multiplication. And so we need to set up another row here that is going to basically do the multiplication of our matrix inverse, which is right here. And now let me let me actually do this as well. Let me um, format that. Let's see here. Let's um, let's go here. Sorry, I wanted to fill this in here. Let's format that because that's what we're actually calculating there. That's the matrix inverse. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do the multiplication and that multiplication of inverse A, which is highlighted there, times B, is going to be my answer to basically the values of x1, x2, x3 that make this equation system of equations work. Okay, so there is a formula again, of course. M M U oops L T, right? And you can see it pop up there. And so it's going to return the matrix multiplication. So I'm going to highlight the first matrix, comma, highlight the second matrix, okay and then 
close parentheses. But again, I have to do the trick, okay? I have to do the trick of Control, Shift, Enter, and then it does it for me right there, okay? So then, I've got my answers there, and I'd like to probably be a good idea to highlight that as well. Those are my answers, okay? And so what we have there is the inverse. I guess you could put this there if you want to and say A inverse, right? So you know that's the A inverse, and then there's my answers. In fact, if you really want to, we could bold them, we could box them, you know, something, whatever, whatever makes it stand out for you. Those are the answers. Those are the values of x1, x2, and x3. Now, if you want to even, you could do this, you know, to make that work as well. So anyway, that's a longer way of saying something that's really simple. Now, what you could do, and I think this is a good idea, you don't have to do this, but I think it's a good idea, is set this up for yourself, and now anytime you've got a three by three, you just put the terms in there, put the B values in there, and boom you would automatically calculate the answers as long as the answer does exist and it's unique, right? As long as there's one unique solution, it will do that. If it's not unique, okay, we'll talk about that as well as we go through. Um, if there's more than one solution, it's not going to find it. Um, if the answer is not unique, you're going to get errors and things like that. If there's no solutions, you're going to get errors. Now, the other thing I would do if I were you is notice here I've got a three by three. I'd probably go down here put this and then change this to four by four and then do it again. I'm not going to do it, but I'm just going to show it, start it, right? I would probably do something like that and then set it up again. You know, you have one there if you want to, whatever, right? You could set up another one for four by four. So every time you get a four by four, you just go oh, put them all in there, done. And you could do a five by five and a six by six or something like that. And, you know, that would probably cover a lot of it right there that you would ever see in a class or see in applications. Uh, if you needed more, certainly you might have to just do it manually uh, when you needed it. But if you did, you know, some of the bigger cases. Now with a two by two, a two by two is so easy to solve just using substitution or whatever that you don't necessarily need to have Excel do it, right? But three by three, that's nice, you know. In order to do this by substitution, it would take me a little while. It'd be kind of a pain, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it just it's just really handy to be able to quickly type in uh, the values in here and be able to produce a solution, you know, uh, a little bit quicker, I think, than your calculator. Uh, of course, there's also online tools that can do this with three by threes and probably four by fours and more, but um, it's a little clunky. You could, you could do that. Um, it's probably faster to just have it in your Excel worksheet. So that's certainly one uh, sheet that I want to do uh, for you. Uh, another one that I want to do, I'm going to hit new sheet here is let's talk a little bit about um, newton raphson So I'm going to call this newton raphson Okay. And, you know, we're going to do the same thing here. Uh, let's see here. Let's do this. Change the row height to uh, 18. And change the... Yeah, about that. Okay. You know, and if you want to type in the top, newton raphson method. Okay, great. Um, and we're going to solve um, a particular problem here. Let me show you here. Oh, do I have the... Uh, let's see here. Well, okay. So the one I wanted to solve for you, I don't think I have a graphic of it, but I have... we'll get to it, is this. Very, uh, fairly simple problem. Sine of the square root of x minus x. Okay, so that function right there, okay, and we want to solve for that equal to zero. Oops, let's see here. I think, I, yeah. Yeah, there we go. So we want to solve for that equal to zero for x. Okay, what value of x makes that equal to zero? Now, this particular problem isn't too bad, but I bet if I asked a lot of students to quickly come up with the derivative, um, they might have a hard time with that. Because as you recall, you the newton raphson formula is right there, okay? If we want to solve for the x that makes this true, okay, we're looking for the x that makes that true. What is, the, it's a sign of the square root of x, and let me actually do one thing to help 
clarify something here. There, that's probably better. Square root of x, sine of the square root of x minus x, like that. Um, what, what value of x would make that true? Okay, well, we could certainly use the newton raphson formula, which is given right there. Okay, we could certainly use that formula. Oops, didn't mean to do that. All right, so let's, let's set this up in Excel. It's actually pretty easy to do. All right, and I actually think it's really handy, and this is another thing that you could do. All right, so what I'm going to do there is I'm going to say x0, x1, and x0 is basically my initial guess. I'm going to make an initial guess of 0.5. Okay, so I'm going to say, let's just guess that it's 0.5. Now, how do I know that's 0.5? Well, certainly I could graph the function, or maybe I have some other reason to think that's a reasonable guess. The good news about these methods is that if you're anywhere reasonably close, you're usually pretty good. But I'm going to show you how sometimes it may not work if you have a really bad guess. Okay, so then the question is, how do I calculate x1 in Excel? Well, I have to type a formula, right? Okay, so take a look at the formula there. If I want to calculate the next value for the newton raphson method, okay, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write equal sign, okay, equals, and then it's going to equal what? The previous value, which is my x0, okay, minus, now I'm going to type in the function, the function evaluated at that previous value, okay? So that would be the sine of the square root of, don't type x, put in b5 because that's what x represents, right? Okay, sine of the square root of b5, okay, which is basically x minus x, b5, right? Don't type in x, right? Divided by, now here's the problem. You have to have the derivative. You would have to have the derivative of sine of square root of x minus x. Well, I don't know how obvious that is to a lot of folks, so uh, I'm going to hit enter on this. We're going to come back. That's not correct. Don't pay attention to that. But we need to actually calculate what is f prime. What is f prime of what is the derivative of that function? All right. If this is f of x right here, what is f prime of x? Well. Uh, you're going to have to figure that out. You could certainly use online tools. Maybe your calculator can give you an analytical derivative. Maybe you pop open your Calc 1 book or whatever, right? But in this case, I'm gonna just going to go ahead and tell you what it is, right? It really is the cosine, okay, that kind of makes sense, of the square root of x, right? Cosine of the square root of x, right, divided by 2 times the square root of x, and that whole thing minus 1, okay? So that is, um, that is what we have for the first derivative, the square root of x, cosine of the square root of x, divided by 2 times the square root of x minus 1, all right? So I found that out. I did that on my own. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to my formula here, all right? There's my formula, all right? And now this denominator of the formula, because again, just look at look on the right hand side and see that's my Newton Raphson formula. I need the first derivative. That's going to be cosine square root of x. Don't type in x, type that b5, right? Right? Okay, so we got that. And then there's that, right? And now I gotta do this divided by, I'm gonna do this square root, I'm sorry, it's two times square root x, okay, and then that whole thing minus one, and that closes that out, and then, um, oh, did I put the divided in? I don't think I put the divided in. Hold on, let's put that in. Okay, there. So hopefully I did that right. Okay, good, there's 0.824. Now, how do we know if this is good or not? Well, what I could do, what I need to do is keep going. So this value is basically what I would call the previous value. So all I do now is I say equal to C5 because that's the previous value. All that's going to do, it's going to copy what I just did down. So basically taking, it, taking the value from cell C5 and turning it into cell B6. It's only going to copy the value, not the formula, right? And then what I can do here is I can, yeah, I can use this little 
trick in Excel where I click on the lower right hand corner, hold the mouse button, drag down, and it will copy the formula down. And not only will it copy the formula down, it will adjust the formula because see this cell C5 references cell B5, but when I pull it down, cell C6 references cell B6, right? Now it's working from B6. So that's beautiful now because it's all set up. Now I can copy the rest of it down and you can see clearly I have convergence at a value of about 0.7686, whatever, right? And that is the correct answer. That is the localized, at least it's the closest route, 2.5 for this particular example of sine square root of x minus x equals zero. Okay, so the value of x that makes that function true is right around 0.77, okay? So, um, and we guessed 0 0.5, that was pretty close. What happens if I were to guess 0 0.2? Sorry, 0 0.2. That sounds pretty close too, right? Uh-oh, not good enough, I guess, right? How about 0.3? Oh, that worked, okay, right? So you can see that sometimes you have to have a decent guess. I'm sure 0.4 would be five, fine. What if I did 0.9? Well, that's fine too. What if I did one? That's fine. What about two? No problem there, right? You can see all of those guesses converge to the same value, right? Uh, three, right? Okay, good. Four, right? Five. No problem there. It might take a little bit longer, a couple more iterations, but who cares? Excel's going to do this automatically for us. Great. Now, what if I did really bad and got to 10? Oh, still okay. How about even worse, 20? Oh, now that one didn't work, right? So if you have a really bad guess that's really far away from the root, then that's not going to work. But again, uh, the original guess, go back to that, uh, 0.5 worked just fine. And so this is nice because now you've got a tab, another tab in Excel, where you can use this to basically solve roots problems, any roots problem. The only problem with this, though, is you have to know the analytical derivative. So if you have never had calculus, or if you even if you had and you don't know how to calculate that analytical derivative, and there's a lot of stuff out there that would be, you know, there's a lot of difficult functions that are going to be really hard or impossible to calculate the analytical derivative. Then this is kind of a pain. The other thing that's a little bit of a pain about this method is that you do have to fill in in here uh, carefully the formula, right? You have to fill in all the stuff here. So every time you redo this, you have to carefully fill in your own formulas. It's not that painful, but it's a little bit painful, right? So now I'm going to show you a third thing, right? I'm going to take that same thing and now we're going to apply the secant method. And the beautiful thing about the secant method, um, if you watch the videos, is that you do not need the analytical derivative, right? That's beautiful, right? We don't need to have the analytical derivative. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. I'm, since I'm going to use the same function, I'm going to copy it. I'm going to go here. I'm going to rename this secant, right? I got a new sheet, and uh, I'm going to plug that right there, and I'm going to still have my, um, yeah, so something like, you know, bigger. I'm making these fonts bigger so it's a little easier to see. In fact, this one I'll make even bigger because this one's going to be even harder to follow as I do this, right? And so what we're going to do is try to solve the same thing I just did with the newton raphson method. I want to now do it with secant, okay? And again, the beautiful thing is I don't need to calculate the first derivative analytically. I didn't need to do that. You could just go right from this function and jump right into calculating it. The bad part about it is it gets even messier trying to calculate this in Excel. So this is going to be a little messy as you follow along, but hey, it's not that bad. So what do we do here? Well, um, if you take a look at the formula on the right-hand side, you'll notice that you have to have a, a xi minus 1. You're going to have to have xi, and then that'll calculate xi plus 1, right? So you really got to have two guesses, two initial guesses uh, for this, okay, uh, in order to calculate xi plus 1. So before with newton raphson we did an initial guess of 0.5, and we knew that was fairly close. So Let's do this instead. Let's do 0.2 and then uh, 0.5, like that, okay? So we'll do something like that. So there's basically two initial guesses. Now, what's the difference between xi minus 1 and xi? I mean, do, does it matter? Well, I would probably say this. If my best initial guess would probably be xi, and then I would have another guess fairly close to it, but you can't have them be the same. 
you can't have xi minus 1 and xi be the same. They have to be different. So I would make xi minus 1 like a little bit worse maybe, you know, and just kind of, it doesn't really matter too much, but, um, you know, I just pick these values. If you had different values, as long as both of them are, are, are distinct, right, they can't be the same number, and they're both reasonably close to the solution, you should be okay, right? Um, if they, if one of them or both of them are far away, then you may have some issues, okay? And we'll try that. We'll, we'll, we'll test it. Now, the hard part of this is plugging this in because it's going to get a little messy and particularly in Excel, you better keep very careful track of your parentheses. So, um, xi minus, xi plus one is equal to, like, take a look at the right-hand side here, xi. So, what's xi? Well, that would be d4, right? That's easy minus okay now this is going to be the function evaluated at xi so this is going to be sine the square root of what d4 because we're at xi right square root of that minus one right that's the oh, sorry minus x sorry minus x there it is d4 right that's x so don't type in x type in d4 right okay good that's the function evaluated at x which is the d4 okay multiply by, now I'm looking at the right-hand side, the top still, uh, xi minus 1 minus xi. So what's that going to be? Well, that's going to be c4 minus d4, right? Good, right? That's simple. xi minus 1 minus xi. Now this is going to be divided by, oops, and then I'm going to have here, on the bottom, the denominator is going to be the same function that I just put in, Okay, but not evaluated at d4, instead evaluated at c4 because it's at xi minus 1. Now, you could be tempted, and this is not a horrible idea um, to do this. I suppose you could do this. You might be tempted is to do a copy and paste. You could copy and paste what you just did sort of in here and paste it in. If you want to go ahead and do that, fine, but you got to be careful and it gets a little messy. So I'm just going to type it all out again. So we got here the function. Now, in order to do this as well, I'm going to actually put open up another um, parentheses, and now I'm only going to put in the function evaluated at xi minus 1. So this is going to be sine, okay, of the square root of, and again, this is xi minus 1, so c4, okay, minus c4, minus x, okay. Now I do that, it closes off that one, and then I'm going to do this here, and I'm going to open up another one, and it's going to be basically the same thing that I just had on top, now on the bottom, but I'm just going to type it out again. Sine of the square root of, now this is x, xi, so this is going to be d5, sorry, sorry d4, d4. Um, and then that is this, minus 1, close that out just like that, so not minus 1, minus x, I keep doing that. Uh, minus x was d4, there we go, yeah, good. So we got that, close that out, and now I'm going to close the bottom, basically the entire bottom of that parentheses. So if you're very careful, and notice the parentheses get really messy. Look at all those parentheses I've opened and closed. Now Excel helps me a little bit by ha having it be uh, different colors, so you know that the same parentheses that correspond to each other are the same colors, but it's still a wee bit messy, isn't it? Okay, so hopefully if I did this right, this won't give me any errors. Okay, there we go. Now, how do I know that's right? Well, I don't for sure, but now I've got to test this theory. So this is the hard work. Right there, what I just did in there, right? That's the hard work is, is just typing that all in right there. That's the hard work. Everything else is pretty easy. Now, what is xi minus one? In the next iteration, xi minus one is xi, because if I'm doing it again, the previous value of xi becomes xi minus one. So this is going to be equal to that value, d4, right? That, and then this value for xi is going to be what I just calculated, right? The 1.04, good, right? Because basically what you're doing is you're moving xi down into the left, xi plus 1 down into the left, and then when you want to calculate the new value of xi plus 1 here, you can just, again, pull, you can right, uh, sorry, left click on the lower right-hand corner, pull down, and you get that value. Now that's looking pretty good, 0.7391549, because remember, what's the solution? 0.7686. So that sounds pretty good. Okay, so now what I can do, if I've done this right, is now click 
all of them, highlight all of them again, left click, lower right hand corner, drag it down, and look at that. Beautiful, beautiful. See right there. I've been able to now use uh, Excel, right? Excel to end the secant method given right there in order to solve for uh, one equation, one unknown. And the beautiful thing about the secant method is it didn't matter about first derivatives or anything like that, right? All of it was totally fine, no big deal, right? The only problem again with this method, and there's probably slicker ways you can do this, um, you know, and that'd be something maybe you guys can figure something out. There's probably slicker ways in which you could put the function in. That's the only issue with this is you've got to like type it in, right? Besides typing it in, it's really easy, right? So let's check out a few different values here. Um, I'm sure, notice again, if you put these two the same, you're going to get errors, right? That ain't going to work, right? These have to be different, right? Now, if you say this is minus 1, let's try that. No, that didn't work, right? How about minus 0.2? No, even probably ne any negative value is probably not going to work, right? How about 0? No, 0 didn't work either. I bet if you did 0.1, it would work. Yeah, okay. So how about if I did this too? Yeah, that's interesting. It worked, and then it gave me some weird error there. I don't know what that's all about. Uh, if I did one, it's no problem there. Um, and then um, 1.5, okay. Yeah, maybe a little weird error, but it still converged. What if I did 10? Oh, yeah, it's still kind of converged. Okay, 20. Let's try that 20. Yeah, that still worked. How about 200? Yeah, hey, look, it's pretty good, right? Uh, it's pretty good as long as you have them both positive. It seems like it's working pretty well. Now that's not always the case, right? I can't say that as a general rule, but in this particular example, that's what it is. So, anyways, what I wanted to do here is, and I hope you follow along. And I honestly, I hope you do this too. Do this when you're trying to solve your own problems. Is build your own spreadsheet. I've already got three tabs. What we're going to keep going in the course is I'm going to show you more and more tabs. We're going to eventually have like, I don't know, 15 tabs. I don't know. So as many tabs as you want. And you can have tabs for every different kind of problem you want to solve. And then you can continue to use Excel not only while you're in school but outside of school in order to solve problems.